So because I'm talking about accessibility, so there's this little thing here. This is Google Slides. I don't know if people notice that there is a caption. So we could try that out and see how it works. Um, so let's see. So my name is, um, oh, hold on. This is, so my name is Zarina Mustafa, and I am a senior front end developer at Columbia University. And um, my department is called the Center for Teaching and Learning. And what we do is we serve the community, community of uh, practitioners of education, faculty, instructors, students. And um, we are a team of 40 people. And the software development team is five people. And I am one of the five. I'm a front end developer. So my focus is mostly on web based applications that we build for the faculty uh, clients. Um, my focus is on user experience and user interface. And for the past two years, I've been working heavily on accessibility. So why accessibility? Thibault already went over why it's necessary for a tool to be accessible. But there is another bigger implication why now we're hearing so much about accessibility. A whole talk can be devoted on accessibility, but it's enough to say that technology is so much part of our lives that we forget about it. Like if I lose my phone today, my Fitbit will tell me that my heart rate is now peaking because I'm panicking. Um, so it's all part of it. And as we are becoming more intertwined with technology, all that technology serves become so fundamental um, service to our lives. And as we have a demographic, demographic shift from baby boomers to becoming like the biggest generation uh, to grow into a certain um, age demographic, and then we have the digital natives coming in to replace that, it is now shifting the economic, demo, uh, the economic outlook also. In, in, in the world, or even in the United States. And it became a much more urgent and fundamental issue that it now is going into human rights. So this is why accessibility, you're hearing so much about it uh, in, in everywhere, whether it's software development or in the media. Um, so this is not accessible because the, the print is too small, but basically, Unless you are Mary Poppins, practically perfect in every way, um, you will benefit from inclusive design and accessibility. Anybody who wears glasses will know if you can't find your glasses, you can't see anything on the screen. So that's like the minor, minor accessibility, all the way down to uh, minor impairments, dyslexia, um, color blindness, um, all kinds of like um, impairments from not being able to hear different tones all the way up to just not being able to hear. So my department, our guiding principle is because we work at Columbia University, education is for everyone. And we have to ensure that learners and educators of all abilities can participate in the education practice. So then our uh, practice is guided by the universal design for learning, which is a concept that is based on the science of learning. Inclusive design principles, which is governing design of software to physical space. And of course, you know, the standards that uh, Thibaut already talked about, which is WCAG. What I focus on primarily is digital accessibility. So anything that we build online or any applications that we build for smartphones, all of our applications and software and websites, they need to be device agnostic. They should work on desktops, tablets, smartphones. They need to comply with WCAG. And guess what? You need to print because people still do print. And you'll be surprised how many sites don't pay attention to print. Um, when you print, it doesn't make sense. So you have all those parts, which is just basically user-facing. But 
how do we build something that is accessible on the user facing side when it's content? So Wagtail is a CMS. Wagtail is an accessible tool. But then how do we build the experience to actually encourage accessible thinking and accessible culture for content um, creators? So we could do that through actually having the models be more compliant to accessibility. And we should build the UI so that accessibility is no longer something that you think about. You just do it as a content provider. Um, so one of the example is like this is a structured content of a website that I presented last year. The model defines every little component to map out to all of the components on the website. But this is something that we already define. We say we want an image here, and this is the, what the image should look like. But what happens when the website is just basically the skin, the theme, and just content in the middle, and we have no control over what the person puts in there? They can put image, they can put text, they can put tables without any well-defined model. And this is usually what happens when we build sites with WordPress. You have one blob, put content here, and then hopefully for the best, you know, good things will happen. But no, everybody has different experience in terms of how they put content in. They cut and paste. They grab images from the web. They make their own image. They put it there. They, they present graphs as images, not like graph as graphs. So how do you solve this problem when you have so many uh, different people with different experience and different style of putting content in? So here we have a, you know, as I said before, so you've got here in this particular site, for example, we have headings, we have text, we have images, any purpose, tables, videos, you know, anything, anything at all that you can think of. So I'm going to walk through a particular project that I was working on this year, um, developing an authoring environment for a project that was on movable type. And now because it doesn't work anymore, we're moving it to Wagtail. It is uh, for a client uh, in the program of averting maternal death and uh, disability program at the Mailman Public um, Health at Columbia. Uh, the project is basically a case study of a fictional country called Lanratam, which is basically maternal spelled backwards. Um, <laughs> And it is like basic, it's a, it's a ministry of health. It has lots of information about the situation in um, mater, uh, maternity mortality in Landrotam. And the students in the class will have to figure out how do we deal with the situation? What kind of advice do we give to the politicians and leaders? What kind of policies do we build for uh, this sort of situation? So why do we choose Wagtail instead of WordPress or Drupal? We all know that Wagtail is flexible. It starts from zero. That's great because you can build up according to how the client prefer to move forward in trying to build the content for the site. Now, the UI for the CMS can be customized fully. And this is where it's very important because it shapes behavior in terms of how you want to put the content in. and then. By shaping that behavior, you are shaping the authoring experience. And hopefully, you know, it becomes intuitive um, as we move along. So I mentioned earlier, so we have heading and text. These are content components that we identified from the old website. And then we went with the client, asked if there's any other components that uh, she would like to add. So we have heading and text, images informative, meaning the image has something going on that provides information. Complex, graphs, complex. Um, charts with organizational charts, it's complex. Decorative is just an image of a building just to break text, so it really doesn't bring any value to the content. And we have tables uh, with headers and columns and whatnot. And then we have a special interactive map that we build 
for them. Um, so what I use is basically Wagtail Stream Feel. Uh, who here is not familiar what Stream Feel is? Everybody's familiar. Great. So I don't have to talk a lot about it. So you got draft tail for heading and text. And then we have images, an image block. We have um, table, I'll speak to that later, Tab table captions, table cells. And then I have a field called sc screen reader, which maps to um, what the tag is called long description. It's not widely supported by browsers. Uh, and then we have a JavaScript activity template, which is another issue. So how do we build this thing then? So we know that the um, accessibility compliance is informed by WCAG standards. Um, there's technical issues to it, something that we can build with templates. We could write the templates, short codes, components for video, components for images, components for forms. But then we have like custom that we can build through the models. So do we need a special class name for a particular div or image? Or do we need to have a special um, captioning for a table? And hopefully when we take all the necessary components for something to become accessible, build it into Wagtail interface with human language, human description, so people don't have to really think about, oh, I need an alt text. Just give them something that is more intuitive. So let's take a look at something, an example that I uh, have here, which is the image component. So you have an image. They want to put it in the, ta in the content. Um, so we have here just a regular image tag. We all familiar with that. So the class could be something that we come up with, like image fluid that we don't want anybody to change. Or we could provide an option for people to put in a class name or an ID name. And then the source, the, the content provider will provide. Um, so this is from the draft tail um, interface. When you hit the button there, um, then that thing comes out has all the formatting, um, whether you want to left align. So that's the, uh, the custom class. And then you have the alt text. So this is like out of the box wagtail. But what if I want a more complex description or uh, use for that image? So then um, I want to have, say, a caption. And I want to, say, have formatting in the caption. And I want to have attribution right there with different kind of formatting. So here we got the same um, image. So the proper semantic WCAG friendly is to have that tag over there, the figure. Because then you can have fig caption, and the screen re reader will identify it properly. This is a figure. And the fit caption belongs to the image, as opposed to just some random text that comes after the image. So you can have attribution there, and you can have like a, uh, the rich text environment for that particular caption. So this is where, when I built the UI, this is where the UI promotes behavior. So you do have the image file, and you ask them to put down the image description. And you can say, you know, I, I have a manual that I provide to the client saying that cap, what's the difference between caption block and caption and what's the attribution. So when they put it in, you know, so you will get back, um, you know, so there's an image and the screen will, reader will read a photograph of um, a clinic building as opposed to the caption, which is the maternity clinic is located in the capital city. So they're two different things. So we build it into um, the template, and we build it into the UI. And they both sort of like complement each other. And hopefully, this will model more behavior, uh, a better behavior in terms of accessibility thinking for content providers. Another example is table. Uh, tables are particularly difficult because it needs a caption to explain what the table is about. 
it needs to be tied with a table. So you can't really have a heading because then it reads heading, then whatever. But if you put a caption, then it will say table caption, whatever that table is. And then you need a, a head, you need a body. And then if you do have headers, you need to tie that to the columns and row, provide the scope for the data. And then you probably want to have some kind of ARIA label, lab, uh, describe, um, pepper it throughout. Uh, so the way Wagtail is structured right now is a little complicated and I have limited knowledge of how those things work. Um, so basically I built this table caption field which is right next to the table and it just translated to into a heading right above it. Um, it's not really great but that's the best thing I can do. For the screen reader text, it's basically a field that I would give the, the content provider so they can put things in there that will be hidden visually, but will be read by the screen reader. An example would be a very large complex graph. You really don't want very large alt text because it's not going to show up. It's, it's going to be very, uh, there is like a limitation in terms of like how much um, alt text becomes uh, useful in, in an image. So we provide, you know, there's a graph showing growth of um, something, something in this particular economic situation. So that is hidden, but the user can actually enter that um, quite nicely. So as I mentioned before, um, in terms of templating, I don't quite understand how things work. My wish item would be for the next iteration of Wagtail, there will be better templating to start. I use the word short codes here. If anybody has ever used Hugo, static site, they do have short codes, um, meaning that it's already there in a template that you can customize later. It comes out of the box, and then you can just take it, make it your own, put things in, and then done. Um, it is not tied to the model. I mean, it's not inside the models.py or blocks.py. It is part of an HTML that you can customize. So that would be great to have if we have something like that. Um, so that the designer or just the front end developer can actually work on it without much um, knowledge on Python. So that's it. It's a short talk today <laughs> to be continued. That's a, yeah. Any questions? Did it work? Did it work? What do you mean? <laughs> Clients are actually uh, producing better more accessible content? Um, so far, because the client's content are already in there, the client is, uh, is just editing. What we want to do is probably model, uh, use it as a model for something else that's very, you know, that requires a CMS. Um, the one that I showed earlier, which is, has a structured content, that's not quite what um, it's not quite freeform, it's structured, so you have to enter text here, blah, blah, blah. Um, we don't know. Um, my group don't usually get um, projects that have, a, you know, that have a need for CMS. We do a lot of Django apps. So we'll, we'll find out for if we get another uh, project, something similar to that. Oh, hi. I didn't quite understand what you meant by the short codes. Okay, short codes are, um, so, Hugo <laughs> uh, is a static site generator. And uh, they have the, uh, a call for a particular template. So figure, for example, figure, and then you put source equals whatever. And then it's inside there, um, um, in inside the MD files that you, when you put the content in. But that's that's how they call the shortcode. But the shortcode is actually a template of a component. So a component like 
Um, one second. This is a component, a figure, an image. So they give you variables for you to fill in. So for example, you have a very, I mean, you already have it technically in um, Wagtail for source, uh, for attribution, um, but the code wrapper is very simple. It's just image. But to have something like this, so I don't have to go hunting for the template and then make my own template, um, but instead have it separated. Okay, here's the figure template. There's the table template, and here's a video template. So simple compo components like that. If you don't need it, it sits there. If you need it, you could port over and customize and put things, a wrapper around it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, there's like little partial templates that you can also pass parameters to. Yeah. But the key point here is that um, developers can go in and do all the things in models and all other Python code. But for people who are straddling between the front end and the back end, this is as, you know the easiest to handle. And, um, uh, and there are a lot of like um, WeCat guides that we probably need to follow and we probably need to add. And you know, like ARIA tags would be great if we have it here. If we don't have it, then what are we going to do kind of thing. Yes. Um, in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned that science people use uh, graphs as images. Yes. So there's no information. Yes. How would you handle a situation like that? Graphs are tricky. Um, graphs, um, there are many, there are a few um, groups and companies that focus on graphs as graphs, as, a, as opposed to a screenshot of a graph. Um, there are many different non-ideal solutions out there. Some people recommend that you take all the graphs and turn it into a table and then have the screen reader read the table, which is pretty cumbersome because then when you change the graph, then you have to change the table and then all kinds of stuff going on. But um, uh, High Charts is one of the companies that work with academic journals to actually make graphs that are interactive and accessible. But um, that's, um, I find it, it's a great start, but there are so many different kinds of graphs and charts that we still have to figure out um, what to do with data because a graph is data storytelling. Um, and you can tell the story from different perspectives just looking at things. And that's like one of the other interesting thing about trying to decipher graphs like when you see things you see patterns but when you hear things what how do you hear patterns so there's a talk in new york um, by this other person who's talking about how they're developing a whole environment of accessibility just for graphs to be continued again <laughs> That's it. Okay, good.